So I'm going to kind of jump back and forth between the general information that would apply to both the adenocarcinoma and squamous cell, and then I'll go back and forth between the specifics between the two diseases. But just to start, we'll go over a high-level overview. Now, there's two major types of esophageal cancer. So the two major types that we have here are the adenocarcinoma, the more glandular type, and the squamous cell carcinoma. And like I said, we'll go through the specifics, but first let's just go through general high-level overview. So first let's start by talking about the symptoms that we would expect to see in general with either esophageal cancer. So in terms of symptomology here, the number one symptom overall is going to be dysphagia. That's the most common symptom that these patients will have, and typically it's going to be more of an obstructive dysphagia because there's a tumor or a mass in the esophagus. And usually there'll be dysphagia to solids first, and then there could be progressive dysphagia to liquids as that tumor kind of narrows the lumen of the esophagus. Remember, with things like achalasia, you might have uh, dysphagia to solids and liquids all at once, okay? Whereas with this, it's more of a progressive dysphagia to solids first. Now, something else that would push you in this direction is the second most common symptom, which is unintentional weight loss. And part of the reason for that is because the patients have dysphagia, so they would experience some weight loss. We said with achalasia, there might be some mild weight loss, but in the cases of an esophageal cancer, especially in a board question, it will be more significant weight loss because you have dysphagia, but you also have tumor-related anorexia, which can also contribute to a more substantial weight loss with esophageal cancer than with achalasia. Now, some other symptoms here you can see they're in green, not as high yield, but chest pain, epigastric pain, retrosternal pain, bone pain, if, it, if you have a metastasis from the, from the primary cancer. Now, hoarseness would suggest invasion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which means this cancer has spread from a primary neoplasm to now metastatic, potentially. So symptoms outside of the esophagus can suggest invasion. Okay, so hoarseness is one. Hepatomegaly we'll talk about is another one, suggesting liver metastasis. So fecal occult blood positive melanin, right? Upper GI bleed, uh, cough. Particularly, you can, uh, you're can at risk for aspiration of these nasty gram-negative pneumonias. With a, with a pathology like this. And that's partially because of regurgitation. And you can also get fistulas that form between the esophagus and the trachea from the tumor invasion, okay? And so um, that's where some of these symptoms come from. But the big one you really wanna remember is dysphagia, solids first, then liquids, and then the significant unintentional weight loss, particularly in older patient, age greater than 50, is really gonna push you down the esophageal carcinoma road. Now, in general, when we talk about the presentation, it's more common in men, and, and most of these esophageal diseases are, so that's not unusual. And then, you know, we said age greater than 50. This by itself is a red flag sign, right? So this, in other words, if age greater than 50 with dysphagia, right, we're automatically thinking endoscopy. One thing I wanna say about the adenocarcinoma versus the squamous cell carcinoma, the Worldwide, squamous cell carcinoma is actually more common. However, the incidence of adenocarcinoma has risen substantially, particularly in Western countries. Um, and that has to go with metabolic syndrome and obesity, and we'll talk about all that in a minute. But in Western countries specifically, like the United States, the adenocarcinoma is gonna be more common. Worldwide though, the squamous cell carcinoma is more common. Now, one other thing on presentation, if you see cervical or supraclavicular lymphadenopathy, again, this is another finding that would suggest metastatic spread if this patient had esophageal carcinoma. However, just finding supraclavicular lymphadenopathy is not specific to esophageal carcinoma. In fact, the Virchow's node, which is actually the left-sided supraclavicular lymphadenopathy, is not actually associated directly with esophageal primary neoplasms. Actually, the right sided supraclavicular lymphadenopathy would be more associated with esophageal neoplasms, and this has to do with lymphatic drainage. Remember, the left-sided Virchow's node, supraclavicular node, receives lymphatic flow from the thorax and the abdomen, and typically this will signify pathology in the testes, the ovaries, the kidneys, the pancreas, the prostate, or the stomach, and possibly the gallbladder too, but not really the esophagus. Right-sided supraclavicular lymphadenopathy would be more suggestive of an esophageal carcinoma, so just something to keep in mind. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to move out out of the general section, and then we'll come back to diagnosis and management. But I wanna just talk about the specifics on adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, because this is where the money is at. Okay, let's start talking about adenocarcinoma. So first, what are the major associations with adenocarcinoma? The big one, this is very high yield. If you can't remember anything from this video, you wanna remember that reflux disease and Barrett's esophagus are associated with esophageal adenocarcinoma. And we're not talking about somebody that has had GERD for, you know, two years. We're talking about someone that's had GERD for five, 10 years. It takes time for metaplasia to develop, right? Because you start with GERD, then you get metaplasia, then you get low-grade dysplasia, then you get high-grade dysplasia, and then you have adenocarcinoma. And for each one of those steps, there's something different that happens. And I talked about all of this in the Barrett's esophagus video, right? If you have low-grade dysplasia, right, there's going to be surveillance. 
you have high-grade dysplasia, you can talk about eradication therapy. And now we're going into the next level in this discussion where we're talking about adenocarcinoma. So this is a spectrum that where this disease will progress and it takes time. So it's chronic reflux over a long period of time that's going to cause this disease to happen. And this is usually going to have to be mentioned in a board question in some way that this patient has had a chronic reflux. And maybe they're obese, right? We already said obesity is classically associated with GERD. And there's two components really when you think about obesity and GERD. One is it's a mechanical process. So think about amplification of the intragastric pressures because of all of that excess adipose tissue, particularly if it's central. This eventually can disrupt the esophageal sphincter function and it can cause hiatal hernias. And we talked all about hiatal hernias and their association with reflux, particularly the sliding hiatal hernias in another video as well. The other component is that there are pro-inflammatory factors that are released um, more commonly in patients that have obesity. And this also contributes to metabolic syndrome, which is also associated with esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now, smoking is also a risk factor, but I don't want you to get too confused because smoking in board questions, smoking and alcohol, especially in combination, they're usually trying to push you more towards squamous cell carcinoma, but it is correct to say that smoking is a risk factor for adenocarcinoma as well. Now, the other big thing that you want to remember is the location. Adenocarcinoma is classically in the distal esophagus. If you ever forget this in a question and you're freaking out, just think about it, right? The esoph lower esophageal sphincter is in the lower esophagus. And so if you have reflux disease, where is the reflux going to predominantly go? It's going to be in the distal esophagus, right? It's going to be in the lower esophagus. And that's where most of this damage is done, most of the metaplasia and dysplasia, because of the exposure to the gastric contents. On histology, you're going to see intestinal type mucosal cells, because that's the type of metaplasia that we get. We're going from squamous, normal squamous epithelium to columnar cells, right? We already talked about this. And we also get the um, goblet cells and the mucosal type cells because we're exposed to all of that gas acid. So you can also see these tubular and papillary structures. So for your viewing pleasure, we went through this in the Barrett's esophagus video, but here you can see the stratified squamous epithelium, and this is a normal esophagus. Now here you can see the stratified squamous epithelium, but now there's this abrupt cutoff where we have this glandular tissue, and we have all these white dots here. All those white dots, let me see if I can make this bigger, all of those white dots are going to be goblet cells. So this is what we would see with this abrupt cutoff, okay, in a Barrett's esophagus, where we're going through a metaplasia from a, you know, going from one tissue type, stratified squamous, to columnar. So in the case of adenocarcinoma, we're not in a metaplastic process anymore. Now we're in a process where we've already went through high-grade dysplasia. Now this has become a cancerous tumor whose cell cycle regulation is now disrupted, right? And so this is what you can see. If you have a board question, they do an endoscopy. There's a tumor in the, in the intraluminal esophagus, right? They biopsy it and you get glandular tissue. It's adenocarcinoma, particularly distal esophagus. Okay, so let's talk about squamous cell carcinoma. So again, Locations now in the past when you got a board question, they'll usually say it's in the upper esophagus or in the middle esophagus. The reality is squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus can actually be anywhere in the esophagus. It doesn't have to be in one location, but they don't want to confuse you in board questions. And so they usually will tell you it's in the middle or more proximal esophagus. But in reality, it can be anywhere. And that's why we have to biopsy it and figure out exactly what we're dealing with. Now, in terms of risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma, it's actually a bit different. With squamous cell carcinoma, the one risk factor that carried over was the smoking. And usually when they ask about smoking, they're talking more about squamous cell carcinoma. But it's a risk factor for both. Smoking with alcohol use actually synergistically exponentially increases your risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma. Alcohol in general is the primary risk factor for squamous cell carcinoma. So it's very frequently asked about. Essentially, alcohol will inhibit detoxification of DNA and cause oxidative damage. And that oxidative damage can add up over time and eventually lead to impaired regulation. Okay. And so that's where you can get some of this development of the squamous cell carcinoma from alcohol use. Also, some other ones to look at. Uh, foods rich in N-nitroso compounds. So these are like the nitrosamine, pickled vegetables, um, smoked meats, those kind of things are uh, put, put patients at increased risk. Not as commonly asked about, but still good to know. And, and the key here is the one thing I want to say is all of these things lead to inflammation of the esophagus. Anything that leads to inflammation can put the patient at risk for squamous cell carcinoma. Also vitamin deficiencies, um, particularly vitamin a and vitamin B1, and then mineral deficiencies like zinc and selenium um, are probably the more common ones that might get asked about. And then we already talked about plumber Vinson syndrome. And the interesting thing here is I already said that you can have bleeding with esophageal uh, carcinoma and bleeding anywhere in the GI tract typically presents as an iron deficiency anemia. Okay, not always there can be more of the anemia of chronic disease, but in general, when you have bleeding in the GI tract anywhere, 
chronically, it's usually an iron deficiency anemia type presentation. And so just because a patient has iron deficiency anemia and dysphagia, it doesn't necessarily mean 100% that they have plumber vincent syndrome. Even if it's more of an upper esophageal mass that you see on like a barium swallow, it still doesn't mean it's plumber vincent syndrome until you do the endoscopy and biopsy. Finally, this one's actually somewhat high yield, these hot and uh, hot food and beverages. I'm not talking about something that you put in the microwave for 10 seconds. This is gonna be liquids that have temperatures of up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, very, very hot teas. Uh, particularly, this is more seen um, in more of the Asian countries that tend to have very, very hot beverages that can damage, burn the esophageal mucosa. And again, that's inflammation, right? That can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. Um, some other ones, red meat consumption can increase the risk. There's certain uh, fungi that release toxins like the aflatoxin is probably the most commonly uh, most common one asked about and i didn't put it on here because i was kind of running out of room but you if you're taking a test anytime soon it's good to write that one down that one's probably a medium yield uh one to remember certain environmental infections can also cause it and then if you have like a caustic stricture like we talked about before if you have like lye ingestion or battery ingestion those can cause strictures and those strictures can also lead to metaplasia dysplasia and squamous cell carcinoma okay so for histology I want you to remember this because this makes things a lot easier. Anytime you have a squamous cell carcinoma, whether that's squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, or just squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, when you biopsy it, look for keratin pearls. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. Is this swirling keratin, like keratin pearl-like structure that's classic for, for any type of squamous cell carcinoma. Some other um, words you can look for in a description is like keratinization. Basically keratin in general as a descriptor of a carcinoma is usually talking about squamous cell carcinoma. And then sometimes you can also see these intercellular bridges as well. So let's wrap things up talking about the diagnosis and the management. So when we're talking about the diagnosis, the biggest thing that you want to remember in a patient that has dysphagia in general or has red flag symptoms like unintentional weight loss, age greater than 50, right? All those things. We talked about this. If you've been watching my videos, you you know I've been saying this for a long time. It's upper endoscopy and biopsy, okay? Especially now that we're talking about esophageal carcinoma because this is what you're looking for when you do the upper endoscopy and the biopsy. And that's because it allows for direct visualization. As you can see you can see here, we have some mass, right? Intraluminal mass. Most likely the way that this exophytic mass looks like it's probably uh, some form of carcinoma, okay? So this is what we're looking for. What about CT scanning of like the chest, CT scan of the abdomen? Would you do this? And the answer is, if you found a mass like this in the esophagus, you would, and that's for staging purposes. And you say, well, why do I, why do I have to stage it? You have to stage it because that tells you what your next steps are going to be. This is particularly important if it's a more local regional disease. So if a patient doesn't have hoarseness and they don't have, uh, you know, lymphadenopathy, you know, in the, you know, like right supraclavicular lymphadenopathy and cervical lymphadenopathy. If they don't have all of those features and they just have a small two centimeter mass, you probably want to try and stage things and get a picture and see if there's anything else going on. And so that's the whole point of getting the CT scan. Now, let's say, for example, you do a CT scan like we see here, and you can see here, there's the, this mass here. So this is the, the tumor in the esophagus. Here's the trachea, here's your vertebra. And you can see that this tumor is invading into the trachea. And so this would tell you that there is some invasion of the tumor. So it's it's not uh, localized exclusively to the esophagus, okay? And so this would be uh, a poor prognostic sign in general. Now, one thing I didn't put in the diagnosis section here is a PET scan. So you might be saying, well, do you do a, a PET scan, you know, to look for increased uptake for metastatic disease? And the answer is that it's it's optional, but it's being used more frequently. And it's particularly useful for detecting lymph nodes that, you, that aren't enlarged, that do have some metastasis so that we wouldn't be able to see on CT scan. You can also see this in bone or in hepatic tissue like the liver. So let me just show you a picture of that. So here, here you can see there's this distal esophageal mass, right? That's what's lighting up here on the PET scan, right? It's uptaking the glu the FDG glucose, right? Right. So that's what we can see here. So there's our mass. We already know about the esophageal mass usually at this point, but you can also see that there's some uptake here. Here's the liver. Okay, so you can see these dots in the liver. So there's increased uptake in the liver, suggesting a liver mets. And then you can also see there's a node here, probably retroperitoneal, that's also lighting up. Now let's move to the final discussion here on this, and that is the management. So the first thing before we go through the management is I, we break this up into stages, one through three and four. So when we're talking about stages, right, here you have the lumen of the esophagus, here's the epithelium, right, basement membrane, uh, lamina propria, et cetera, going all the way down. And then here's this the lymph drainage. And so you can see that the tumors, right, eventually will metastasize, get into the lymph, and then uh, cause this lymphadenopathy, okay? this is And I love this image because um, you can see here, when you initially have this, this tumor, the T is for tumor invasion, okay? So it's, it's a TNM classification. So T is tumor, 
N is the lymph node, and then M is if there's metastasis. And so for most cancers, usually you're going to have multiple T's and N's, by numbers for them. So T1, you can see it's just intramucosal um, and submucosal, so there's a couple different types. And then there's T2, where we start to invade into the muscul uh, muscularis propria, so T3, T4. So these tumors are getting larger and larger as we go to these, these higher scores. And then you can see N would be no lymph node involvement, N1, 1 or 2, and then all the way up to N3, which is 7 or more lymph nodes. And then there's also M, which is for metastasis, and that's binary. Either there's no metastasis, so it'd be M0, or M1, there is some metastasis. So if you have, you know, like we saw in that PET scan, if you have uptake in the liver on a PET scan, you're already M1, right? You've already uh, found that there's some metastasis. And that, again, is gonna be significant because the metastasis is gonna put you into the stage four category, which is going to change your management. So one stages one through three are gonna be more local, more uh, local regional disease is the correct term to describe it. And so in general, in this category, what we would probably start to do is we can consider en uh, endoscopic mucosal resection. If it's, especially if it's a really small tumor, you can just try and take it out. But in general, like we said, we're gonna biopsy it. We're gonna see what we're dealing with. And then what we'll do in these situations usually is we can do some chemo radiation therapy. Now this is gonna be neoadjuvant therapy. Neoadjuvant meaning that we're going to give them chemotherapy before we do any surgery. And this is gonna usually be with cisplatin and 5-fluorouracil. Now we can also give radiation therapy and that radiation therapy is just gonna target that one site where the tumor is at. And we're gonna to try to get the tumor to get a little bit smaller by giving it radiation prior to the surgery and we'll give them chemotherapy just in case there is any spread or beginning of invasion of other structures. We can tune that down a little bit by giving the chemotherapy early. And then what we'll do is usually they'll wait like three to four weeks and then they'll go in there and they'll do some form of surgery. In a lot of cases, esophageal resection, depending on how much is involved. And there's, there's a lot more that goes into this and I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but this at least gives you a high level overview. There's also some newer medications like the uh, Keytruda or the uh, Pembrolizumab, which targets specific types of tumors that have specific tumor markers like PDL1, which is a big one. Um, but we're gonna pass on that discussion for this video. But um, in the future, maybe that's something I'll talk about. Okay, so EUS or endoscopic ultrasonography. So this is sometimes used for biopsies and in general, it's gonna improve staging accuracy. And so let's just take a quick quick look at what this is. So M and the MM, so this is the submucosa muscularis propria adventitia right around the esophagus here. And here's the aorta. And here you can see there's this, where these arrowheads are at. And this is a, this is a, possibly a transmural mass that's invaded all of the walls here and that's by the esophagus and so what you can do is when you when you go in there with the ultrasound you can actually biopsy um, that mass as well using fine needle aspiration and in general the EUS is the most sensitive test for determining the depth of the tumor and how much invasion there is which are things that we look at for that T score of the TNM classification okay so when would you consider a complete esophagectomy via surgical intervention right we already said with Barrett's uh, disease when there's high grade dysplasia we can consider an endoscopic resection depending on you know how much dysplasia we're dealing with is it in one area has it yeah, in multiple areas of the esophagus or the esophagectomy to actually take out the you know the entire esophagus you have to make sure this patient is a candidate for surgery and you know you you ideally they don't want to have any mets right if they have mets they're in stage four you're not going to even do the esophagectomy okay and if they have invasion of nearby structures like we saw on that ct scan where the, uh, the uh, tumor was invading the, uh, the trachea we wouldn't do esophagectomy in those situations either so there can't be any mets there can't be any invasion of nearby structures and the patient has to be a good surgical candidate they can't have heart failure you know severe heart failure and copd and stuff like that right but those are common things we would already expect right if we were doing a, sur a major surgery on somebody and then stage four right this is going to be the metastatic spread in this case um we would give systemic chemotherapy with palliative care or just palliative care right it depends on where you know where the Mets are, if the Mets are in the liver and the brain. Okay, guys, that was a pretty long one, but I hope that it was informative for you guys, and I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you guys liked the video, drop a like down there. And uh, if you're not subscribed, do so for more videos. And I'll see you guys in the next video.